How's it going? Are you well? There's a few of you this morning. Nice to see you. Turn to the person next to you, kiss them on the cheek. You, act, some of them are just sitting there and going, there's no way I'm doing this. None of the new people are coming back. Any new people here this morning? <laughs> we don't usually kiss each other on the cheek, but it is fun from time to time. So, Awesome. Hey, I know we just worshipped. I just want to open up in prayer. It's been an um, interesting week for me, so it'd be good just to invite the Holy Spirit again to speak through me so you hear something decent this week. All right. Uh, Lord, you're a great God, and um, I want to thank you for big and small things. Lord, I want to thank you the Highlanders beat the Waratahs. That's important. I want to thank you, God, for food on our tables and for um, great friends and family. Um, all that stuff, Lord, right through to here we are um, trying to deliver a word, Lord, hopefully from you. And so pray, I pray, God, that as we, we come and we share this morning together and we live in community, Lord God, this thing called the church, which is just a community, Father, of believers. Of, and Lord, also for people who don't know you, Lord, we welcome them as well. God, we pray not only just for ourselves, but also for every other church that's meeting, big and small, Lord God, not only just in this city, in this country, but all over the world, Father. We thank you for friends and family who aren't with us, and we ask, Father, for your blessing upon them. Lord God, we love you. Uh, you're a great God, and we pray the Highlanders do win the Super 18 or 20 or 27 or whatever it is. And everyone said? Everyone said? <laughs> For those who are new, I'm from Otago originally, so that's why we pray for our beloved Highlanders, um, but I can see hatred in your eyes. Uh, please, please forgive me. Yeah, come on, Peter. Great to have Peter with us. Give Peter a hand. He's from Dunedin as well. Great. Well, I want to talk this morning about um, when you're facing really difficult times, and so my title here is very simple, really. Like, in other words, ever have those moments with God where you're like, really, God? Anyone? Am I the only one? Three people. Awesome. But sometimes I do have those moments I'm like, really, God? And sometimes those moments are tough because it really does squeeze my faith and it makes me wonder, what do I really believe in? Am I really going to stay the course? You know what I mean? And like, is it just me or just others like that from time to time things squeeze on? And, and I've realized for me that sometimes what is difficult and tough choices, and when I'm going, really, is two different kind of ends of the spectrum of understanding. So one end of the spectrum happened to me this week. Um, having, for those who don't know, um, I'm, I've now passed the senior baton on over to Anton Porro. Just give them a hand. Can't wait. They're going to be so good. Um, and if you missed that, you can jump online and uh, listen to that message from last week. We just really felt God was challenging us to do that. It's been super, super duper tough. And so I'm kind of preaching this message out of that a little bit, um, but it's been the right thing. But I've understood sometimes that when I'm going, God, really, that there's two ends of a spectrum of understanding. So one end of the spectrum for me happened this week when um, uh, Boyd, who's a pastor from Auckland, he came on down. He's uh, part of the national leadership team, and he just wanted to come down and show some support, and he did it the best way a man can do to another man. He shouted me lunch. Every man right now, your amen is, uh, uh, uh. Right. So we go out for lunch, which was awesome. And um, but what I realized is that it became a difficult thing because they give you the, what's called the menu. Anyone had a menu? And on this menu is like 14,000 different choices. And I said to Boyd, Boyd, what are you getting? And he goes, brother, because he's Indian, brother. He says, hey. <laughs> Gavin's looking at me <laughs> and goes, fish and chips. And so I'm like, well, fish and chips, that sounds really good. And he said, but you can get it whatever you want. And so I'm now faced with this smorgasbord of choice, and it's really difficult. Anyone been to a restaurant, and you, you think you know what you want, but then you look down the menu, and you're like, oh, my goodness. So just, I could get fish and chips. It would be amazing. Or I could get ribeye steak, or I could get you know, a chicken thing or a burrito thing. Or if you're a vegan, you can get carrots you know, or, and boil water. Or you know, There's just so many choices for you. And so I realize sometimes there's a tension because you understand that the choices that you have are so good, and so you, it makes it really difficult. But on the other end of the spectrum, you have choices in life where you don't understand, and you're kind of faced with, okay, I know this is the right thing to do, but it's the hard thing to do, and I don't get it. 
It just does not make sense. And then, of course, as Christians, we think of scriptures, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And it really, I guess, tests those scriptures. It does for me anyway. In the last little while, it's tested those scriptures for me, that kind of thinking. And um, in some ways, we should all be used to this kind of thinking and this tension because for all of us, if you're alive and you're a human being, you had a parent growing up. Everyone say amen. You had a parent growing up. And so we know what parents do to us all the time. Don't we, kids? If there's any kids in here, you know what's coming. You want to do something. You want to go somewhere, be with those friends, watch that movie, do this behavior, and your mum or dad is going, "Uh uh-uh, that ain't happening. And you're like, but why? And they just go, the one word, and we all hate it, don't we? Because. (laughs) We know this. It's the only answer you get sometimes. Because. I said so. Mm Mm-hmm. And then, of course, there is tension in that, isn't there, as children growing up. And we spend so much of our life having getting used to the concept of because I said so. It's a difficult thing. But what's interesting, of course, is being a parent and being on the other side and having delivered a couple of because sentences to my children growing up is that sometimes the only reason I say because is because I just know that they're not at a place that they can understand the because. They're not at a place where that I can work through it with them in a way that's really healthy. And so ultimately it comes down to, as a parent, we know this as parents of our kids, is, is you just have to trust me. You have to trust me that I have your best intentions at heart right now. And that is a difficult. Trust is a very little word, but it's a very big concept to get our heads and hearts around sometimes. It's difficult. But I know as a parent, and I know that when you transfer this over to our walk with God, that very often God is saying, trust me, not because he wants to do you harm, but because he wants to help. Not because he's got something bad for you, but actually usually the very opposite. He's saying, one day something coming, you have no idea what it is. I do because I'm God and I see this far, you only see this far. One day you're going to look back on today and go, wow, man, if that hadn't happened, boy, this wouldn't have happened. And sometimes you're just going to trust that one day is coming and it's going to be amazing. Can we get an amen? Come on, I need some feedback today. We need some feedback. But in between, it's difficult. And the question that I guess I'm asking today is, how do we get through those difficult times? Because Jesus' disciples absolutely went through some pretty difficult times with Jesus. We often think of Jesus as, you know, you see all these pictures of him long flowing hair, and he's looking beautiful, and and he's smiling at everybody, and, you know, and he's sitting down with children, and they, and they all love him, and he's hugging them. And then we've got pictures of Mother Teresa, you know, saying how beautiful he is, and how wonderful he is, and the love of Jesus. And all that stuff is true. But there is other times when Jesus turns up as a different Jesus. And he's a difficult Jesus. And he's the Jesus that we don't understand, and we're all going, Really? This is not how you build pastoral care, Lord. I don't know if you know this thing. I know you're God and all that. You created it all. But this is not the way to do it. I just want to give you some advice. And we're going to look at a story this morning where all of his disciples are saying that very thing. Really? But one of the disciples has some incredible insight at the end of this. Words that if you would take these on board, when you are going through your really moments... Because this is the thing about the really moments. The really moments are crossroads moments because they squeeze your faith. And even when you're doing something for God, who knows that if you've been a Christian long enough, when you're doing something for God, it still squeezes your faith in God. Isn't that true? Like you're doing it for God. It's the right thing. It's like, okay, God, okay, God. But there's another part of you going, God, I really don't like this or possibly even you right now, if if I'm honest. God, I'm really struggling with us because of what you're asking. It's like the whole parent-child thing, right? The child is like, you know what, Dad, and you know what, Mom? I love you, but in this moment, I don't know if I love you. You know what I'm saying? Can we admit that as Christians sometimes? That's just me? Yeah, sometimes that's the reality, isn't it? And it's like there's this tension going on. And so we're going to look at a story this morning where this tension came up um, for the disciples, and it was a big one. And uh, if you've been a Christian for a while, you would have heard this, but we're going to go through it, going to have some fun with it. We're looking at John 6, we're going to start at 48. 
And this is, Jesus has fed 5,000 people. Okay, so for those who are not Christians, not church people, Jesus did a lot of miracles, great miracles. He healed people from blindness and sickness and raised people from the dead. And and occasionally he would do these miracles uh, like this one where he had fed 5,000 people just from a a little bit of bread and some fish and he made it expand. It was like magic. We call it magic today. It wasn't magic. It was the power of the Holy Spirit, but it was just an amazing miracle. And so he feeds 5,000 people. And so he's like, if you want to grow your church, Right? I know that if I really want to grow my church, what would be awesome is instead of me preaching, I just I take one crunchy bar and I say, everyone come on up, and, the whole, and, it's, and it's, everyone gets a crunchy bar from one. You know, that would be an amazing miracle. And so Jesus does this. He, he hands out and feeds 5,000 people. And this is a big deal back then because they didn't have supermarkets and shopping malls like we did today. They didn't have McDonald's everywhere. They had McManor. But they didn't have McDonald's, okay? They had McManor, they had McManor burgers, McManor McShakes, and McManor toasties, and McManor everything. But they didn't have McDonald's. And so Jesus has done this incredible miracle, and he's got thousands following him. And that's the moment you want to kick in the whole PC machine and the PR machine, right? You want to get the best of the best and the brightest minds in and just make the most of this moment. So what does Jesus do? Nah. This is what he does. He says to his disciples, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. Now, of course, for all the Jewish believers, they understood instantly what this means. They knew the stories of the Israelites coming out of Egypt. For those who don't know, Israelites come out of Egypt. They get stuck in the desert. They have no food and no water, but yet God provides them supernatural, this manna that fell every day um, from, the, from the sky and appeared on the ground, and they would eat this manna every day. And so they understood. So Jesus is saying, they had manna, and that was good, but yet They died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, I'm better than that. And all those people who knew Jesus and saw him grow up as a kid were going, no, you're not. We know your parents. We know who you are. You just... Jesus, like you're a great guy, and when I really think about it, yeah, I guess I haven't seen you sin, and you're really wise, and yeah, we're really impressed, but actually, you just, you just, Jesus, and Jesus actually was a common name back then, you're just Jesus, you're just, it's like, you're just Andrew, and I, we knew your parents, and they were great people, and you're a great, but you are not that, and so <laughs> they're starting to wrestle with this whole idea, and so Jesus called like, Work with me, guys here. Work with me. Listen to what I'm trying to say. And he goes on and he says this. This is how not to win people over. Okay? This is weird when you think about it. Think walking dead. Honestly, listen to this. This is a statement to make. We get so used to these statements reading the Bible, but I want you to think about the statement. Okay, here's how to win people. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, let's just pause there for a minute. (laughs) Emily, would you like a bit of a drink here? Can I just open up a vein for you? Would that be, are you sure? She's like, hmm, no, I'm not coming back now. But like, when you think about it, this is what the dude's saying. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, and they were all like, ew. The whole PR machine was like, no. (laughs) They were all just sitting down, they were backing off. They are like, oh, oh, no. And you've got to remember that these guys don't understand the concept of communion because Jesus hasn't told them yet. And so this is how he introduces the concept of communion. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up in the last day. I mean, try that with your friends. You got someone who's not a church person? Come on, drink some blood, eat some flesh. That'll get you into heaven. Now, if I stood up there and preached that, 
as the pastor, you don't walk out. I understand that. Because this, let's be honest, this is weird. Like, we know what it's about now, but for them, this is weird, weird, weird. For my flesh, he says in 50, verse 55, is real food, and my blood is real drink. Let's just say it again. Yuck. Thanks, Jesus. You're a great guy. I love the whole beard thing. It's awesome. But really, your blood and your flesh. Emily is right there now. She's squinting her eyes as she's thinking about this. But it is really weird. Now, this is where it gets interesting because a wee bit more conversation happens between the disciples and they're asking some questions and Jesus is not being really clear on this still. He's just not super clear, right? He's not unpacking the theology of this very well. We, we know it now. And Paul especially unpacks it later on and Jesus unpacks it just before he goes to Gethsemane. But right now he, he doesn't. We're going back to trust, remember. They don't understand. And in verse 6 through 60, it says, On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? That's their question. This is a hard teaching. I don't know if we can accept this one. This is really, really difficult. And for the disciples, it's super duper difficult because a moment ago, they were rock stars in this world. I mean, they were the boys hanging out with the man. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, they were around the man. You know, it's like with that crowd. You know, Mike, who do you hang around with? Oh, you hang around with him. Oh, really? Oh, Mike, can I just introduce myself? That's awesome, you know? Like, these guys have connections to Jesus. And so, one minute, they were awesome. Everyone loved them. We came to them. And now, they're thinking, what on earth am I doing here? This guy is talking crazy stuff. And the word actually, when it says this is a hard teaching, who can accept it, it actually means who can embrace it. That's what the Greek means. Who can embrace this teaching? It's so incredibly difficult for them at this time. The disciples are pulling back. They're leaving. This is a big, big deal. All the PR machine is going, this is not how you build the church, Jesus. This is, this is bad. It's not good. And the crowd, which was actually their protection up to this point from the Pharisees and Sadducees, who were actually quite dangerous people because they had links in with the Romans, but they could cause some damage. They could cause you grief. And of course, Jesus is becoming known in the Roman world as well, which is a brutal world. And so now all of a sudden, all their protection is starting to disappear, and they are starting to get worried for all sorts of reasons. John 6.61 this is what Jesus says. Aware of his disciples were grumbling about this, he asks, does this offend you? In other words, does this, does this teaching make you stumble or fall or rethink? That's what the actual, the original means. And the answer is an emphatic, yes. Yep, Jesus. Does make me rethink this whole thing. Because you just went to weird mode. You went to walking dead mode right there. You went to vampire mode and to all the modes that we're not, I mean, for the Jewish culture as well, I mean, even for any culture or most cultures, we know they're eating people and drinking their blood. We just know naturally it's like, Egh, right? We don't have to have a law for that. But for these guys, under the Jewish law, especially doing something like that, drinking someone else's blood was absolutely considered detestable to them. Absolutely. It was like, it was the worst thing he could have almost said. So he says, does it offend you? Yep. John 6.66, and it says, From this time, from this time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. In other words, this was the end of the big crowd. This is me standing up here and saying something that sounds like heresy, and you all going, nah. And a few saying, that's what's happened. In the church context, this is absolutely what happened. And so the disciples must have been tempted as well because this was such a big deal for them. And then Jesus, knowing this, he turns to them and he says, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. And of course, once again, the answer must have been for some of them. Thinking about it, this is pretty difficult. 
Because for these guys, it had gone from being easy to hard. It had gone from understanding, for the most part, to really not understanding anymore. This is where trust comes in. And this is a crossroads moment for them because many proved that this crossroads moment was the end of them. And so they left. Haven't we been there in our faith sometimes? I have. There's times when God has challenged me. There's times when I've heard things and it's crushed me. And I'm like, God, I, I, I don't get this because I don't understand it. And this is the moment that these guys were in. This is the moment where people consider their options. And I've seen that. If you've been a Christian for many years, you've seen people consider their options. Do I stay as a Christian? Do I not stay as a Christian? For many, it's too much. And this was the moment that these guys were in. And the reality is, guys, if you are in that moment for your life where you are tempted in your walk with God to go, you know what, I, just, I don't know if I can do this anymore. Then we see that Peter here is about to give you an insight that if you carry this insight into your life and into your walk with the Lord for the rest of your life, it will serve you very well. Peter asks a question here that is far better than the question the previous people asked. They said, who's this teaching? Who can accept this? That's a question. But he asks a better question here. Simon Peter answered him. Next slide, thanks. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Really simple. Lord, to whom shall we go? That is a great question. Because these guys have given up everything to follow their master. And they're in a position now where they don't understand it. They don't like it. It's all weird. But ultimately, this is where the kid trusts the parent. This is where the kid says, you know what, mom, you know what, dad? I don't like this one, but okay. And ultimately, these guys are saying, you know what, Jesus? We know enough about you and have seen enough about you to go, where else are we going to go? Like, we've been looking for you in the scriptures for a thousand years and more, and you have finally come here. Where else are we going to go? To whom shall we go? And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Because, although this is hard, Peter goes on and says, because you have the words to eternal life. You know, I've been to university and I've studied to a reasonably high level. One thing I found about studying at university is that there is a million different ways to look at life. Life is not black and white. We'd like to think it is, but very often there's a lot of gray out there. I studied as a social worker and one, a social worker did one thing, it tried to mess your world up and say, have you thought about it from this angle and from that angle and this angle? And blah, 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 blah. But Peter says, you know what? I don't get everything, but what I do know is that you have the words of eternal life. And more than that, he says, we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And that is a great point to come to in your Christian walk, that you don't understand everything God does, you don't like everything God does, but you know that he is the Holy One of God and that his words are eternal. And that he's saying this not for your harm, but to help. He's not saying this to hurt you, but to actually progress you towards the one day. And I love that. And if you forget everything else today, then I want you to try and remember this one thing for your life, because this is one thing that I've had to try and hold on to through this really difficult decision, because it's been so difficult, and it still is. Like, love what God's doing. I actually, I love what God's doing. But this is a difficult time to pass this on. And it challenges me and go, oh, you know, what am I going to be like? Who, what kind of person am I going to be? But these words ring true in my heart. To whom shall I go? There's only one. Because here's the, here's the reality. If you're in a place where you're finding it difficult and you're thinking about, you know, I don't know if I can do this Christian thing anymore. And I've seen plenty of people do that. This is the reality. is, is you are going somewhere to someone. You're going back to some behavior. You're going back to some relationship or company or friends that you know are not good for you. For some, they'll go back to alcohol. For others, they'll go back to drugs. For others, they'll just go back to a life that they know was not healthy and it was void and it was empty. But they'll go back 
to it. And so the question is, is if you throw your faith away, where are you going to? Because you are going somewhere. You're not just going to avoid. You're going back to someone, somewhere. And for others of you, I guess you, know, you need to understand that ultimately that one day we're all going to stand before the Lord. That's the one day, the, the ultimate one day, one day, that we can stand before him because this life will finish and we are going to stand before the Lord one day and he's going to ask, to whom or where did you go? And my prayer for you is that the whom and where you go is back to him because he's the one who has words of eternal life. He's the Holy One. May you, like the disciples, keep coming back to that point. To whom will I go? To whom will I go? And that's a great question because questions shape your destiny. You know, some people get stuck in life because they're asking the wrong questions. The other followers ask the wrong questions. This is a hard saying. Who can accept it? That question's not helpful. It shapes your life in a bad way. These guys asked a better question. So where else would we go? Takes you up. One takes you down, one takes you up. You've got to learn to, in life to ask better questions for a better quality of life. It's very, very important. And you know the great thing about the story, one of the things that I love about the story is that Peter, who is the one who gave this insight and said, Lord, to whom where do we go? When you look at his life, man, isn't it magic? I mean, this dude, like, he trusts Jesus enough to go, I don't understand it, I don't like it, and I wish you hadn't have said that. You know, that's really what he's saying. I wish you hadn't have said that, it's really weird. But there's a couple of things that happen later on in his life where you just go, the man, one day kicks in. Today I don't understand, but one day kicks in. And we see that a couple of times when Peter denies Jesus. But then after Jesus arises from the dead and he's spending time with, with Peter, we see that forgiveness and reconciliation happens. And I believe that that happens because Peter beforehand in his heart of hearts went, Jesus, where else do I go? And so if he could trust him with the I don't know and the I don't understand, he can trust him with the I understand that, thank you. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, if you trust in the hard point, then you can trust in the other points as well. You can trust when you mess it up that God's going to come down, and when he says, I forgive you, you can trust that he forgives you, because you can trust him when you don't understand in the toughest moments. And of course, the other great thing to this story, that those who walked away from him didn't understand, is that later on, of course, this was the ushering in the, of the greatest covenant they could ever come under that actually the flesh and the blood of Christ was a symbolic act of meaning to say, it is done, it is finished. You don't have to live under the law anymore. You don't have to live under guilt. You don't have to live under shame. I'm going to take it all on the cross if you would just accept my blood and eat of my flesh and be part of me. That is the greatest thing you could ever do. But these guys forfeited it. Maybe some of them came back later on, I don't know. But they forfeited it simply because they were in the box of I don't understand. And they threw all the toys out of the cot and they walked away. So may you today, team, whatever you're facing, understand one day is coming. Learn to ask the great question, to who am I going to? And to always come back to a Jesus who loves you, is always there for your very, very best. And he's got your future and your plans and all your hopes all bound up in his hand and he's never ever going to let you go trust in it persevere even though you don't get it that's what I'm going to do that's what I am doing and I thank God for people like Peter amen can we stand and I want to pray for you